Survivor 46 is here, and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast, and we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Vyadaris, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not and, uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more know, doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Stephen Kreisick of the Lotto Jumbo team as well and Adam Yates of Orica Green Edge and Anthony Turgis who had a little bit of a tumble as he headed in towards Scarborough but stayed on his bike. Great Britain have won their first medal. It was Adam Peaty in a world record time, breaking his own world record. She punches the air and she crosses that blue finish line. The world champion of 12 months ago, who finished second here last time around, has won it. The Athletes' Village is not a place for fighting. I've never heard that ever in Olympic and Paralympic history. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast covering the games all the time rather than just once every four years. I'm Michael. And I'm John. And coming up in this episode, 12 months on from an Olympic silver, a golden evening for Bruce Mower and Scottish curling at the Worlds. Britain's latest swimming stars shine in Sheffield. And we'll have our news from the games, golf, judo, tennis, snooker and much more. And as ever, you can let us know what you think. Get in touch anytime. You can find us on Twitter at anythingbutf. Message us on Instagram or on Facebook. Find us online, anythingbutfooty.com. Or drop us an email, anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. So we'll start with curling and winter sports. And well done to Scotland. World champions in the Men's World Curling Championships. 14 years since they last won the title. They beat Canada 9-3. They did lead 6-1 at the halfway point, And they won in the eighth end after scoring a three, the Canadians conceded. So well done to Team Mowat. That's Skip Bruce Mowat, Grant Hardy, Bobby Lamin and Hammy McMillan. It now means that Scotland have the world gold, the European gold, and of course, as Team GB, the Olympic silver. And this is just the latest winter sports triumph uh, for British athletes over the winter months. If you recall, mm. Team GB, just two medals in Beijing at the Olympic Games, both of those in curling. But they really have bounced back this season. They've won 80 medals at World Championships and World Cups this season. They've won medals in every World Cup snow discipline that they compete in. There's been a European silver medal for ice dancers Lewis Gibson and Leela Fear, a long track speed skating bronze for Cornelius Kirsten, a bobsleigh World Championship silver for Brad Hall's four-man Bob, and Matt Weston, 15th in Beijing, and all those complaints about the equipment that the skeleton racers were using is now the skeleton world champion. It has been quite the winter for our winter sport stars from this green and pleasant land. I wonder, Michael, we we picked on this in the last episode ahead of the Summer Games in Paris when we talked about uh, the retirements and Adam Peaty pulling out and and the mental strain that that the pandemic and having two Olympics in three years was uh, was, uh, bringing on our athletes. I wonder, because you've gone through those stats and it's an incredible year, as you say, for British uh, snow athletes and winter athletes, whether it's a year too late. And the reason why it's a year too late is because, of course, we had a pandemic for a year and for six months they could hardly train. So it, it, as it worked the other way round with the with the Winter Olympians. 
Yeah, I think some people might make the argument, of course, that this is the year in terms of that four-year cycle that we've spoken about quite a lot. We've had the four-year cycle for the Winter Games, and this is the year when a lot of the major nations probably have taken their foot off the gas a little bit. So there's been that opportunity. But I do think that British athletes probably were affected more by the pandemic in terms of the winter sports than they were in terms of the summer sports. Not being able to travel, not being able to train properly. Harder to improvise, I think. You know, we saw the likes of Max Whitlock and Adam Peaty improvising in the way that they were training. <laughs> Harder to do that, I think, uh, for a winter athlete when you're confined to your house. So, yes, it has come a year too late, but let's spin that and think, well, three more years to build. And some of those sort of silver medals that we talked about in the Bob Slay World Championships and the, the figure skaters, Lewis and Lola as well. Some of those medals over the next three years, the bronzes could be silvers and the silvers could be gold. And certainly when you look back to the, the podcast we did, our Great British Bosses podcast, of course, when we went to GB Snowsport and they mm. were saying, obviously, this, this stated ambition to be one of the top snow nations uh, in the world. Well, it, well, it's come true this year. You know, they are one of the top snow nations in the world. And I think three, three more years uh, of training and competition, uh, hopefully without any pandemics or interruptions. And I would be broadly quite confident going into Milan Cortina. And great news for British curling and Scottish curling as well, because as you rightly say, it was an amazing uh, Olympics a year ago with Eve Muirhead winning that gold medal and Bruce Murray uh, winning the silver, as you say. But obviously Olympic coach David Murdoch has moved on. He's gone to, to Canada in the, in the last six months and Eve Muirhead has retired. But this shows that A, the men's team are still curling on, on top form. And when we get a new Olympic head coach and, and you see the, the, the next three years develop, that they're still on that that kind of uh, right track to deliver uh, once again in Milano Cortino. So it was an amazing, uh, um, I sat and watched it as you tend to do uh, back in the day on CFAX when you used to just watch the scores coming up and I was watching the curling final uh, with the with the numbers coming up and a couple of twos here and a couple of twos there and you mentioned a 6-1 at, at half time as I like to call it uh, in curling and they absolutely uh, blew the home side Canada away. So uh, well done to the boys and you know them reasonably well Michael from your time covering uh, Beijing. They're, they're huge um, Glasgow Rangers fan. Is that right? Oh, no. Yeah, is it, uh, yeah, they are Rangers, not Celtic. Yeah, I think so. Well, they're big football fans, um, some bigger than others. But, you know, what I would say as well is, you know, with uh, the, the women's team, uh, with Eve Muirhead, you felt that in 2022, that was their finale. Well, it was their finale. Sort of events subsequently approved that. And you just felt they were maybe always building towards that, that golden moment. They'd done it in 2002. Two, and then suddenly 20 years later they were back having gone close in, in previous editions of the games and I'm just wondering whether when we get to 2026 for the men's team for Bruce and Grant and Bobby and Hammy if indeed that team stays together as Team Scotland and then uh, representing Team GB whether that might just be the end of, of their story and an end of their story that finishes on the top of the podium and you did curling commentary I mean I said I watched it last night on CFAX virtually but you did curling commentary not, not really officially did you but you were literally having to talk the final yeah i am in the middle of the night on radio and uh, my youngest daughter walked in in the middle of it because i'd obviously woken her up but yes i got to describe i got five minutes uh, of national radio to describe uh, the winning stones for uh, great britain winning the gold medal with uh, eve muirhead and the team brilliant stuff now still to come our latest news from the games but first swimming and the british swimming championships in ponds forge in sheffield of course remember built for those student games in the 1990s as we heard from a, a recent great british bosses that we did staging these trials for british swimming ahead of another world championship later this year in japan in july they come round really quickly at the world swimming championships or world aquatics championships as they're now called and i noticed as well that World uh, Swimming FINA as it used to be called has now rebranded itself World Aquatics so following in the footsteps of Sebco and World Athletics from the old IAAF so the World uh, Aquatics Championships will be taking place in Japan in July some big wins though in Sheffield this week for the likes of James Wilby winning two golds in the breaststroke without of course Adam Peaty as we discussed in the last episode Freya Colbert European champion won 400 metre individual medley in a World Championship qualifying 
time. Olympic champion Tom Dean and fellow Olympic medalist Duncan Scott battled it out in the men's 200 metres individual medley, as they often do at world level and Commonwealth, as we saw in Birmingham last year as well. Both going under the qualifying time. Dean winning, Scott in second. In the women's event, Katie Shanahan and Abby Wood did similar, pushing each other to the qualifying times in their event. And superstar of 2022, Ben Proud, also continued his super fast swimming in the men's 50 metre freestyle and Daniel Jervis in the rather long 800 metres freestyle as well. All those getting world qualifying times. And it was the final night as well where there was a slight shock. And we always like a shock in sport. If not, it would be predictable and no one would watch it in the men's 200 metres free as Dean and Scott were beaten by Matt Richards, who absolutely clawed inch by inch Dean back in the final 50 metres to claim his gold medal, a British Championship win and a world qualifying time. James Guy grabbed third ahead of Scott, who was out in lane one, and they all, all four of them, swam fast enough for the World Championships this summer. What a relay team in prospect and what a great week of swimming for British swimming. An embarrassment of riches, I think, for British swimming at the minute. And when you, you name some of the people you've just named, the likes of Tom Tom Dean and obviously we know that there was no Adam Peaty there but Duncan Scott and uh, others there James Guy they must all just be pushing each other on it must be the the competition internally mm. must be driving that British swimming team on and on to, to greater heights you know I think we saw well we know that we, we saw a brilliant Tokyo a record-breaking Tokyo but you know, if anything, I think we've seen since Tokyo is that this team could maybe even go bigger and better. I think Paris will, will suit the British swimming team because there won't be the, the final sometimes in the morning, for example, to suit television. It's going to be, you know, as we would expect, a more traditional program with heats in the morning and finals in the, in the evening. And I think that will suit the British swimmers. And I think also... It- to say these world championships are a great opportunity for someone to claim gold and make names for themselves. We saw Ben Proud do it last year, as I mentioned, the superstar of 2022. But also we know that come Paris, swimming is such a competitive sport that someone comes from nowhere. We saw it a little bit with Tom Dean uh, at Tokyo, didn't he? He came and won that 200 metres freestyle when everyone uh, was maybe expecting Duncan Scott or others to do it. So I think that's the that's the issue with, with swimming, that you will get some more surprises over the next couple of years. So these are performances that we should be celebrating right now and looking forward to. But remember, like Rebecca Adlington before Beijing, no one really had heard of her. She came and blew us away way with those two gold medals uh, in the uh, in the pool in the freestyle but then four years later in Paris uh, four years later in London couldn't quite reach the, the same levels winning a couple of bronze medals so we know how competitive swimming is particularly at Olympic level but these world championships in the summer in Japan will give us another guide as you say to where we'll be in Paris. On to our news from the Games now. We'll start with some gymnastics. And three-time Olympic champion Max Whitlock has withdrawn from the European Gymnastics Championships. It was going to be his first competition since Tokyo. He's withdrawn with what he said is a minor injury. So, fingers crossed, it's not too serious. Uh, The competition takes place in Turkey. And on to diving. Congratulations to another one of our podcast regulars and favourites, Tom Daly. Congratulations to Tom and his husband, Dustin. They've welcomed baby Phoenix Rose Black Daly to the family now. 28-year-old from Barica in Spain, John Rahm is the new Masters champion in golf, the first European to actually win the Masters and US Open. Uh, That is an incredible achievement, of course, unlike Rory McIlroy, who's still trying to add the Masters to his other collections. He finished on 12 under par at Augusta, four ahead of Brooks Koepka, who'd led virtually from the start and uh, in slightly uh, unfortunate circumstances, didn't speak to the media afterwards, didn't want to uh, speak to them. Uh, Phil Mickelson was in third, another live tour golfer like Brooks. And it was interesting because there was a lot of talk before that final round and uh, the bad weather, as you would have seen in Augusta over the weekend, meant that we had the third round finish and the fourth round on the same Sunday. But they got it done. They always get it done. It's only happened three times where they've gone into a Monday. They're so precise in Georgia. They like to make sure everything's in the right place with all the T's crossed and all the I's dotted. And they always finish on a Sunday and they did but what they were saying before uh, Brooks Koepka fell away in that fourth round was actually 
by being a live tour golfer and not playing as much, was it actually being beneficial for him? He'd pulled away from golf saying he was struggling mentally and physically with the game. But actually, by the end, he seemed like he'd run out of steam. But in contrast to that, Phil Mickelson came storming through at the age of 52, one of the oldest uh, uh, competitors to finish in the top five. Talking of old competitors, a quick word on Sandy Lyle, someone I know that we uh, look back on in our childhood and remember him wearing that green jacket. He was the first British golfer Michael in 1988 to win the tournament and wear that jacket he finished his career he got a rare Saturday appearance because of the bad weather on 10 over par uh, but he finished that and he started something I think in that period for British golf something with Woosnam and Nick Faldo a couple of times as well there was a golden period for British golf in Augusta and uh, we wish Sandy Lyle all the best in his retirement. And how appropriate, I think, that a Spaniard was winning at Augusta as well as we remembered Seve Ballesteros on what would have been his birthday. And just an interesting one, I just want to get your thoughts. Obviously, you talked about media interviews. What do you think about Rory McIlroy giving an interview on a headset in the middle of his round whilst playing a hole? Well, I think... Firstly, I think there's two parts to that. Firstly, I think the interviews actually add something to it. And the reason why I say that is that I was listening to a bit on Saturday morning when we had the end of the second round and it was pouring down with rain. And they interviewed Justin Thomas uh, while he was mic'd up on the course. And the question was, what challenges do these conditions bring? Now, you could have got a really stock answer from Justin Thomas, but he turned around and just said to the commentators, well, how long have you got? which I thought was a really good way of, of seeing how they uh, how they work together and what they're thinking while they're walking around the course. Because we've all played golf and we all think, you know, it's a long walk between hitting one ball and another. Usually, not for me because it's going zigzag, but for these guys, there's a long walk and what are they thinking? So I think, I think it's worth having because I think it brings insight. I think the big question mark for Rory uh, is that it seems to be an issue, the Masters, he want, I mentioned earlier, he wants to win it. He wants to win it for the first time. It's the only major he hasn't uh, for a career Grand Slam. He hasn't won a major himself now since 2014. So it's coming up 10 years. And I just think it, it, there are ways of playing it. L- last year, I think he went into it really seriously and tried to focus and it didn't work. So this time he, he tried to treat it as a normal, normal tournament. And they do use these, these um, interviewing techniques at other tournaments on the PGA Tour. So I think he was trying to play it. So I think it's really easy to say to him that he shouldn't have done it, especially as he missed the cut and he was the favourite for the tournament. But I think generally those interviews are fantastic to see. And wouldn't it be great... Um, If sometimes we could have that with some of our Olympic sports, Michael, you know, we have Usain Bolt on the starting lineup with a microphone just before he you know, maybe takes his tracksuit off and, and gets into his kit. That would bring something else to sport coverage, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, I totally agree. I think it was a brilliant innovation. And obviously, you know, the old traditional golf tournaments now, the likes of the Masters and the Open are competing against some of the innovation of the the Live Golf Tour and, and some of the other tournaments and what they're doing. So I do think innovation is required. You know, I love golf, but I hate the stuffiness mm. around the sport. So I'm all in favour of it. And going back to the Olympics, I think if you look back at some of the comments that Olympic champion Greg Rutherford made, how the charter that the athletes have to sign up to to compete at the Olympics, obviously, we know is very, very strict. And it means that you can't do social media, for example. So he's always made the point as a, as a field athlete where he's got time on his hands, if you like, yeah. in the middle of his competition. Why, why athletes are prevented from using that time and that opportunity. And not every athlete would want to do it. Others might. Greg Rutherford might have wanted to do it. I think of someone like Jasmine Sawyers, a recent European indoor champion, very prolific on social media. She might like the opportunity to, mm-hmm. to do some, some social media, for example, or, or do little in-competition interviews. And I think as spectators and the audience, I think we would love that insight. And, you know, as I said, not everyone would want to do it. I don't think you could force everyone to do it, but maybe give people the choice or the opportunity to do it would Mm. be what I would say. Here, here. I agree. You're listening to the Olympic and Paralympic Sport Podcast, Anything But Footy. Stick around and stay with us. Coming up very shortly, we will be talking judo, we'll be talking tennis, talking snooker, and looking at this year's London Marathon. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. 
And that is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and, not uh, as simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast. Now, I don't know if I've mentioned, but I think that judo is going to be a great sport for Great Britain <laughs> at the next Olympic well, Games. So I, we'll continue, I think you we'll might have mentioned it on, a couple of times. We'll continue our news from the Games. It's my two things I think about Paris. I think judo is going to be good. And I think the mixed relay between uh, Great Britain and France is going to be one of the highlights of the Games. But anyway, <laughs> on to our other news from the Games now. Uh, judo, the recent Turkish Grand Slam's taken place. Well done to Chelsea Giles, medalist at the last Olympics. A silver uh, to add to the goals that she's won in Israel and Portugal in the Grand Slam recently. And Lucy Renshaw is back to world number one as well after winning gold in Georgia. That is her sixth Grand Slam title of the season. Now, just as we'd finished recording our last episode, it was announced that Wimbledon, the All England Club and the Lawn Tennis Association had decided that Russia and Belarusian athletes, the likes of Victoria Azarenka, could come and play in the grass court tournament this summer. Last year, of course, they were banned. In 2022, they weren't allowed to be neutral athletes. But as a response, Wimbledon had all of its ranking points taken away, as did the LTA tournaments as well. Now, there's been lots of talk about it. We're not going to repeat our Russia and Belarusian discussion that you can go back to the last two episodes and listen to because you know, you're more than welcome to go and do that. But what I thought was interesting and why I wanted to bring this up was the statement that came from the Lawn Tennis Association, Michael. And I think this shows the pressure that some some of our sporting um, events are under with what is going on in Ukraine at the moment. They said a year on and the suffering of the people of Ukraine as a result of the war in their country continues unabated and problems in tennis or sport more widely are insignificant by comparison. However, we have m- had to re- overturn our decision to ban Russian and Belarusian players because of the real prospect of the termination of our membership if we repeat the ban in 2023 to both the ATP and the WTA tours. And they said, in effect, that would have meant that Queens, Eastbourne, Birmingham and Nottingham would not have taken place and could have never taken place in the future. And they say we have consistently opposed these sanctions and remain deeply disappointed by the penalties imposed on us. So it shows that organisers are really having to think about how they are going about putting on these events because of the pressure that they're getting from other sporting organisations and federations further up the chain. Yeah, and Wimbledon have had to fall in line with the other slams, and I don't think they could be an outlier there. They obviously, as you mentioned, were fined. Uh, the ranking points obviously weren't available for the players. So the Ukraine foreign minister's reacted, says the decision to allow the return of Russian and Belarusian athletes is immoral, uh, has asked the government to deny players visas to come to London for the tournament. Uh, I would add, though, that players are going to have to sign declarations of neutrality. Uh, they are not able to express any support for the war. And I'm sure the IOC will be watching very closely what happens at Wimbledon. We know we've spoken about it at length. Thomas Buck will be looking looking at all of these landmark moments over the next year or so before I think there's a final decision made ahead of Paris 2024. And no players will be able to play at Wimbledon who are funded by the state or sponsored uh, by state-owned companies. Mm, It's going to be interesting, but I think you're absolutely right. Uh, The main people who will be delighted by this announcement are probably Thomas Back and those at the IOC in Lausanne. Absolutely. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic Sport Podcast. Now, I always like this time of year because I'm of an age where (laughs) in the springtime, Des Lynham would arch an eyebrow at the camera on grandstand and they would cue in some maybe Lightning Seeds, Life of Riley style music or the (laughs) theme tune to Miami Vice. And they would play a little montage of sporting events that were coming up over the next few weeks. And that would probably include the boat race, the Grand National, the US Masters. It would probably be the FA Cup semi-finals. And then two that I always really like, the London Marathon 
and the World Snooker Championships, part, I think, of Britain's Sporting Spring. Mm. So we are delighted to be involved in both events this year, the London Marathon and the World Snooker. I'm going to be covering some of the World Snooker for Talk Sport. Looking forward to uh, going to the Crucible on Friday, the Friday before the tournament actually starts, to uh, gather up some interviews and meet some of the top 16 players there. And then looking forward to keeping across the snooker at the Crucible Theatre over the next two and a half weeks. It's always a brilliant tournament, which concludes, of course, on a, a bank holiday Monday. And it's always been an event that I've always watched, always followed ever since I can remember. Mm. And I can probably name all the champions through the 80s and the 90s. Well, Steve Davis and Stephen Hendry. I mean, you're, <laughs> up, you're there with sort of... 13 there, aren't you? Then you add Ronnie O'Sullivan in and you've got 20 of the last whatever. So it's not that difficult, but you know what I mean? It's always been an event uh, that I've loved. So I'm really glad to be adding it to the portfolio at Talk Sport. And then you and I are both going to be on the finish line at, at the London Marathon. Yeah, really I've looking I've been telling everyone that. I'm doing the London Marathon this year, by the way. I keep having to tell you to my son, Matthew, I was like, I'm not, I, I'm working the marathon. I'm not running it. He keeps saying, daddy's running the marathon. I was like, no, I am working the marathon. I'm definitely not running it. Yeah, the uh, TCS Marathon uh, is back, of course, in April, first time in, in a number of years that that has taken place, as you say, Michael, in the spring, the sporting spring of, uh, of, of British sport, which is great to see. Um, a really nice, part and we've got a couple of podcasts coming up which will have one kind of previewing the event uh, next week and then one reviewing it as well but I thought it was a really nice idea that the thousands of runners because Michael you have run a marathon I know and you, you often mention it here and there. There's a law isn't there if you've run a marathon you will tell people <laughs> you've run a marathon and exactly. I have run a marathon <laughs> and slowly. you've probably kept your medal or your t-shirt or something that you've been given uh, to recognise that but I thought what a really nice thing that London Marathon events are doing this year is they're working with trees not tees uh, throughout 2023 to offer participants in all of their running events including the marathon uh, and the option to opt out of receiving an official finishers t-shirt and have a tree planted instead which i think is just a different way of recognizing what an amazing achievement it will be to run 26.2 miles and sometimes we you don't have to mention that you have run that marathon and you can say well actually i did run a marathon and i planted a tree as well so you can have double double the uh, the celebrations I was actually thinking it's 10 years ago this year since I ran my marathon, which means it's about nine years, six months ago since I finished it. <laughs> um, I have still got my, my T-shirt. In fact, my, my eldest daughter um, wears my marathon T-shirt in bed. And I do have my medal. It hangs on my little studio as well. So terrific memories. But what a great innovation. I think if I had the opportunity to give up the T-shirt and plant a tree instead, I definitely would have gone for the tree. Hmm. Absolutely. Now, as ever, you can get in touch at any time. Uh, our podcast will be coming out, so make sure you follow us wherever you're listening to this over the next few weeks. We've got lots coming up, as Michael said, with Marathon and Snooker. You can follow us at Anything But F on Twitter or message us on Anything But Footy at Instagram or on Facebook, Anything But Footy. You'll find us there. Our website is anythingbutfooty.com or email anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. Well, I'm off to YouTube, Des Lynham and Grandstand <laughs> Spring Sporting Montages. So just for your own imagination, think of those pictures, those images of the US Masters Golf, the boat race, the Grand National, the London Marathon, the World Snooker, and just imagine that Miami Vice theme tune playing around in the background. Sports Social Podcast Network. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, avoid, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.